Good evening, everybody. Welcome. It is a pleasure to have you all. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ozzy Burnham. You probably know me as the Baltfila who's leading this group here, so let me give you a little bit about my Baltfila bona fides. Uh, I've been dominating for the Emmett for about 25 years now. Uh, I've led dominating in probably hundreds of venues, uh, everywhere from state prisons to the Kotel. Um, I've dominated for people who can't speak Hebrew. I've dominated for household double names like from Shmuel Kamenetsky and Rabbi Raphael Cutler. Uh, so I've sort of been around that block. I'm also the Baal Musaf here in town at Oratora for Yom No Rhyme. So I'm Dabin Musaf on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, which is, I guess, sort of like if you're looking for uh, the most grueling, what do they call it? Um, in the Marines, you know, like SEAL Team 6, they put them through that awful week, that like death week or whatever it is. Hell week. Hell week, exactly. So that's like the hell week equivalent of davening is uh, the Dabin Musaf Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And uh, thankfully, I've survived for three years now. Uh, so, Baruch Hashem, I'll have what to share with you. Um, I want to begin by just sharing some general principles of davening. You'll forgive me if I loosen my tie. This is a general tip. Anytime I go up there to davening on Shabbos, and I mean anytime I loosen my tie, but then I have to confess, I do tighten it up before I take out the Sefer Torah. <laughs> because I like to have a good looking tie, but it also <clears throat> opens up the passageways. Um, general principle about leading davening. Tefillah is really, really hard. For anybody, davening is hard. I mean, we're trying to create a conversation with, you know, another being that like, just doesn't respond. So you're trying to carry on this dialogue, which in many ways feels like a monologue. Oh, doesn't respond? Excuse me? Right. I think he does. Of course, sometimes the answer is no. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> of course, in the, in the sense the that there's never any you know, immediate response. It's not like a conversation, it's not like a text message. Uh, and it, it's challenging. I always perceive my number one responsibility. I'm sorry, am I making a couple of mistakes? I'll try to stay right here. Okay. Yeah, I recognize. I gotta be right over home plate. So I believe that my primary responsibility as a Baltfila is to somehow make that experience easier on people. The way I sort of see it is if you've been to a Kumsitz where there's no guitar, it's really nice. They're singing, it's beautiful. But when you're at a Kumsitz where there's a guitar, it just changes the experience in a really meaningful way. It creates that rhythm backbone to the singing. And that's what you're really there to do as a Baltfila. You're there to create the backbone for people's davening experience. And that affects the davening in many ways, large and small. As an example, I'm always trying to pace myself by the tzibor. Some tzibors really like to be slow and schluppy. Like, that's how they like to daven, and that's okay. If they like to daven with lots of kavana and they like to draw things out, wonderful. Why should I speed them up? On the other hand, uh, some people are in a rush. It's, uh, you know, the 625 minion, and people, you know, have trains they have to catch. There's no reason to impose your own slow pace. You're there to enable their davening experience. In a similar way, whatever key that Sibor adopts, or whatever tune the Tibor adopts. If I feel like you know, I started a tune and they didn't quite get it, and they started a different tune instead, I'll go with that. So long as you're comfortable doing that, because I'm just here to enable them. Or for example, again, if I start at one key and they can't quite hit that, and they do a different key, that's fine. That's no problem. I'll be happy to do your key, because I'm just here to enable your feel experience. Um, another really important idea that everybody should be aware of um, you know, I know like Michael Buble or my, my voice teacher tells me that I have the voice of a vocal tenor, which is like Michael Buble, this popular singer. I, I don't fantasize that I'm, you know, a rock star. I have a nice voice, but that's about it. Something that's really important to know is that people will forgive a voice and they'll never forget an experience. Think about Shlomo Krabach. Shlomo Krabach had far from the greatest voice. He was no Pavarotti. And yet, at the same time, he's perhaps the most well-known composer, and his tunes are perhaps more popularly sung than any other composer the last, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 years. The people will always forgive a voice, and they'll never forget an experience. So whatever your voice may be, focus on delivering the experience, and that's going to make a huge difference. 
Um, mistakes happen. Mistakes always happen. I make mistakes also. I made mistakes on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, where I prepared for months. My father uh, taught me two of the most important principles that I applied to davening. And my father, who incidentally cannot carry a tune, never davens for the Yomid, but nonetheless, uh, well, except for when he has a yard site, he shared with me two of the most important principles. One of them is a business principle that people won't judge you based on the mistakes that you make. They'll judge you on how you recover from those mistakes. So assume that you'll make mistakes. The best way to recover is to just smile and have confidence. I've seen people turn around and give that look like, <coughs> oh my gosh, what did I just do? I'm sorry. And they'll go up to you know the rub or the Rosh Hashiv or the president, the God, like anybody will listen and <coughs> take forgiveness. It's okay. People understand. That smile of quiet confidence will do everything you need to do to restore uh, whatever misstep may have happened. <coughs> Um, the second idea that my father taught me, and this is when I was probably about seven or eight years old, he said, it's really important for you to listen to these Bali Tfila because that's how you're going to learn how to daven. And he's actually right. Uh, there was a piece of advice. Ever since I was a little kid, I just listened to Bali Tfila and I listened to the nuances. And I can detect very slight nuances in a tune because I've developed a practice of just simply listening to Bali Tfila. And when there's somebody who's good, it, it's a thrill for me. I, you know, every time somebody steps up there and I hear them belt out shochenad, I make a split second decision. Like within three bars, I either tell myself, wow, I am like glued on, or like, okay, nice, it's going to be another davening. So if there's somebody who's davening you feel you can learn from, it's a fantastic way to learn. Uh, two other final <coughs> ideas in of introduction, having to do with practice, since I mentioned practice. Um, one is, I can't tell you that practice makes perfect. It, it won't make perfect, necessarily. But there are two important things that practice will do for you. One of them is that you'll anticipate issues that might arise. Classic example. So, you might know how to do the davening for Yom Tif. Shafras, Hallel, you might know how to do that, even Hallel's no problem. You might not have ever done that on Sukkot, where you're carrying the little of an and the way in which you shake your little Vanessa is different than the way that Seaborg shakes the little Vanessa. And you might not pick up on that until you're up there with your little Vanessa. You're like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? I hope I have an art school sitter that gives me all the instructions. And uh, so, what I would recommend is if you haven't had experience with that field before, definitely do a dry one because it will help you anticipate areas where you might be weak or things that you might have thought you knew that you didn't quite know, questions that you might have, and so on. Uh, the other thing that it will do is it will add confidence. And uh, those of you who follow professional sports, which is, you know, with American males, about 100% of the audience in any room. Um, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, 98%. Uh, <laughs> you know, <What>? Wow. It's <laughs> a rough crowd. Okay. <laughs> so, point being, uh, those of you who follow professional sports know that a lot of the high-level performance has to do not as much with skill as has to do with what they call the mental game. I, I'm a, I follow hockey, and back when I was a big hockey fan, there was this guy named Patrick Waugh. And he was a decent goalie, but where he really shone was in the postseason. He was just amazing in that when there was high pressure. And that's a big part of the dominant. A big part of the dominant is what's going on in your mind. So if you practice beforehand, it will give you confidence, and that will be hugely valuable. Uh, the way we were going to uh, discuss with Stuart, the way we had thought it might be helpful to go through the davening, is that I was going to open up the center, start with the beginning of davening, and just begin with lechun aranana, and share with you the nusach. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to stop, ask questions, details, and so on. Uh, I will be making recordings of this davening. Uh, that will be posted online. You can be in touch with Stuart about that. So you can certainly review any of the davening. And uh, you know, you can, he'll give you my email address. I can give you my email address. You're more than welcome to contact me with questions. But before I begin with that, since I open with basic introductory remarks, I imagine there are probably questions that people have before we even get started. So I do want to open the floor to any of you for any question related to davening that might smooth this process for you. Are you going to be including different nigunim for some of the o'clock night? Okay, so because of our limited time, I'm going to try to keep it fairly standard. Um, but maybe online I can provide a few variations. Any other questions? That would be good. Okay. Yes? 
And so if you don't mind, just your name, that is easy, right? And your name is? Rick Greenberg, Richard Greenberg. Um, how do you replicate, in terms of trying to acclimate yourself in the environment that you face, okay, so you don't get flop sweat, okay, how, how, do you, how can you acclimate yourself to that actual situation? Where you're up there, there's a lot of people there, the acoustics, etc. How, how do you do sort of a dry run? Athletes are able to, do, I don't know how exactly they get on the field, they, whatever, they put loudspeakers on with crowd noise. How are you able to yeah, the I, that's exactly what I was going to say. It, well, I, I was a rabbi at the University of Maryland for many years. I worked in Kiruv uh, at an organization called Moor. And I used to get such a kick out of the way in which the football team practiced, because they would literally, I mean, you probably all remember this from college, they would have this piped in noise with which they would practice. We can't do that. What I'd recommend is start small. So if, let's say, for example, there's a simcha, and you know, your family is together, and it's after a large meal on Shabbos, uh, mor uh, Shabbos morning, and now it's milcha time, and there's an opportunity for you to daven milcha for the yamid. Or there's an opportunity for lead, uh, you know, Friday night davening, uh, when there's a smaller crowd, you're traveling, whatever it may be. Take those opportunities, those are golden, and build up from there. So I would not recommend, if, if you're not quite confident with big crowds, you know, taking on the uh, Shomri main minion as your first debut. But there are, there are plenty of opportunities in smaller settings for you to take that first step. Any other questions? Okay. I guess I've covered everything. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to open up to Lahuna Ranano, King of Shabbos Davening. Uh, I am, uh, I'm going to start with the standard Nutzuch, not with the Karbach Nutzuch, and I'll tell you why. First, it's far more standard. It is, uh, you know, of all the Minyanim in the world, I'd say maybe 5% of them, 10% of them are Karbach Minyanim. Overwhelmingly, you're going to find the standard Nutzuch. Furthermore, it is very easy to find Karbach resources online. Uh, there are some great albums that you can buy. Um, if you're a member of Spotify or I think even Apple Music, you can download, they have some great versions of the Kabbalah Nusuf. So that there are plenty of resources there. There are less resources for the standard Nusuf. Okay, I'm in the RSL Sitter, it's on page 308. If you have the all Hebrew Sitter, it might be on a different page. But I'll begin as I would. I'm gonna use Hashem's name because I'm gonna be using full sentences. I'll just begin with the Nusuf, and if you have any questions, um, I'll, I'll Pause after each paragraph and we'll take them there. Lachu neran and all other I know, and a ring of the tour ye shay knew. Always important to start with that. I, in many shuls they do, but start strong. I always get up there, whatever it is, whether it's Barhu or Lachu neran and all, or it's Bechom Misha Oskim in Musaf on Shabbos, I always get up there and start strong. You want to let people know, you're in for a great dominic. Out of a matter of practice, I always start, uh, or almost always start, with the, the art scroll diamond is. Most American shoals have the uh, art scroll, including this shoal here, and it's just easier for everybody. They're usually spot on with it, and I, I start with that. Arboim shana akutidor Voim aram teile bovein Veim lo yadu dirochoi Asher nishpati viapi Him yevoyun el menuchasi If you are doing a Kabbalah Nesach, Shir Lashem Shir Chadash will be sung, but if you're doing the standard nosa, the rest of the stanzas, you're just doing the end. So I'm going to continue with Yismechu HaShemayim. Yismechu HaShemayim v'sogel horet yiram ayam uloyoy yavoy sodai v'cho asheboy oziran anu ko atzeyar v'ifne adoy noy kivo kivo lishboy toret <clears throat> you might notice, I have a good time when I'm up there. I really do enjoy it. Uh, and I think that's part of what allows people to enjoy your dominating. Um, if you've gone to live music performances, my wife and I love going to live jazz performances. 
I can't tell you how much more enjoyable it is to watch a performance when it looks like the band's having a great time. And it's no different, again, going back to that idea of being the rhythm guitar for those who are there in the Dominic. If you're having a good time, it's going to be that much easier for other people to have a good time. Oh, I bet I have a dinner, I see the rush, I mer nash, I snassy dog, Another comment I wanted to add about having a good time. You might notice, if you're an observant, very observant you, uh, that I'm smiling when I dive in. Uh, part of that is, like I said, enjoy yourself out there. The other part of that is pure technique. When you smile, you're opening up the chambers in your mouth, and that allows for your voice to resonate. So resonance is you know, a very basic idea in music. We have an expert in resonance. I should not be the one speaking about it. But uh, it, the, the basic way, uh, it's, I think it's best explained is, if you take like a glass vase and you fill it up with pebbles and you like just put a little ping on the vase, you'll ba barely hear anything. But if you have an empty vase and you put a ping on that vase, you're going to hear a really nice tone. In a similar way, when <clears throat> you allow your voice to take up more of the spaces in your head, the more it projects. And also, if you have the choice to dive in, in a larger space or a smaller space, always dive in, in the larger space. Ironically, when you have more room, your voice resonates much more than when you're in a smaller room that's uh, more crowded. Um, I dive in, as I mentioned, at Oratoro, which until now has been in the basement at the University Towers, and it is brutal. It's absolutely brutal. I can tell you that I uh, have dive in at Six and I Synagogue, if you're familiar with the that, that downtown. It's got a huge, beautiful edifice, a dome that's got to be like three or four stories high. It is much easier for me to dive in and to fill up the room <clears throat> at six and I than it is for me to f to properly resonate in the basement at the University of Towers. Mm -hmm. So just a, a nice little tip to know. Um, also, yes. In terms of projecting and singing loudly, I mean, sometimes I'm told that I can't hear you in the back, you know, kind of thing. What are there tips for reading from the diaphragm or for projecting that way? Or? Yeah. So I'll tell you. You can gain a lot by just watching YouTube videos. Um, and there's also, um, there's a great course, it's called Singing 360 Success. It's I think like $300 or something if you really want to make an investment um, by the guy that trained popular singers like Taylor Swift and whatever. Uh, but that's a, an online program. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I have paid for voice teachers just because I adopted them professionally, uh, sort of, um, for Yom No Rhyme. Uh, but you can get some great stuff online. Let me share with you some very basic tips. Um, and some of them, it's, they're really hard to uh, experience until you've dobbined in the wrong way and felt tight and constricted, and then you've dobbined in the right way and you feel like your voice is that much more open. People say, you know, dobbing from your stomach, but project your voice. Yeah, it, it all sounds like fluff. Yeah, yeah, just whatever. We all get up and do the same thing after that. But <clears throat> here are some really helpful tips to be aware of. Uh, one, of course, your, your sounds come through your vocal cords, which are, as you can imagine, cords. You, you can see videos of them on YouTube. It's pretty interesting stuff that live in your throat. Many people make the mistake of actually using their vocal cords to sing. And that puts a lot of stress on the cords and puts stress on your voice. So the, tr the trick is to try to push the air through the chords and to allow the, the music, the sound, to come from through the chords as opposed to in the chords. What does that mean practically? It takes a little visualization and it takes practice. But if you can imagine your voice not coming from your mouth, which most people imagine, but imagine going it, the voice going over your head, over and above your head. And imagine the sound coming from inside of you and then moving up and above your head. I'll give you a practical example. I'll take, let's say, just you know, the, the next uh, piece that we are going to sing. I'll sing it first, at first from my vocal cords, and then I'll sing it projecting. And now I project. 
I can tell you that when you try the two of them, at a certain point you'll start to detect where it is that you're pushing through your chords and where it is that you actually bring your voice from beyond your chords. Yes? Forgive me if I make a suggestion. I started taking vocal lessons when I was 15 years old. One of the first things my teacher taught me is he says, drop your jaw and open your mouth and let the sound out. Right, right, sure. And, and smiling is one of the things that does that. But to give you to give you an example, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. My mouth my mouth wasn't closed, was it? Right. No. A lot I, of people a lot of people try to sing with a closed mouth. Open your mouth. Sure. As oh, wide as you can. I, I, although I would, I, there's something I want to caution. I mean, that was beautiful. Um, I, I want to, just a quick note about uh, cantorial singing. Um, there's an old joke. Singers sing, cantors can't. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a certain uh, chazanus-oriented sound. And some places absolutely love it. Um, you know, there, there are still shoals around that have a professional chazan. In general, although I can sing in a sort of cantor style, I personally stay away from it because I find that most people don't really like it. That the tastes have changed, and it's not something that people enjoy as much as they enjoy just a nice, sweet, sort of melodic type of davening. Um, so you, your tip is correct, whether it's done in the chazanist form or not. That is, when you open up those passageways, it's true that you're able to allow the sound to project more effectively. That's actually, I wasn't trained Chazanus, I was trained Bel Canto, which is what they train opera singers with. Ooh, even better. <laughs> All right, but, but I mean, yeah, okay. it, you, you gotta open your mouth. Sure. Yes? How do you do that again? <laughs> Get that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, like I said, it takes some practice and you'll see, you'll know that you're doing it correctly when you feel less pressure in your throat. Most people by nature, um, sing through their chords. It's actually, my, my voice teacher told me that it's a learned thing. You'll notice that babies can scream for hours on end and they don't tire because they actually, they project properly. <laughs> and then somehow we, we unlearn it. <laughs> yeah, but it takes about 20 years. <laughs> right, so uh, we unfortunately, I don't know exactly how it happens, but we unlearn it and we tend to project from our, our vocal cords. But what you'll notice, and again, it, what it takes is like, you just, and what my voice teacher had me do is just try to, here's another thing that they do, which uh, I wanted to mention, the second point, uh, the visualization, the second point that I found useful is um, constantly keeping the breathing flowing. So I, I, I still can't sing from my stomach, I, I don't know where my stomach is, how does that, my diaphragm, I, to be honest, I can't do it. I, I know a lot of singers do it, they talk about it, et cetera, but what I do, which I found very helpful is to make sure that there's constantly air coming out. And that airflow makes a huge difference. Uh, I know the first year I, I like really focused on that, the first year I died on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, I almost blew out at the end of Rosh Hashanah and then the, at the end of uh, Mosef on Yom Kippur and then this tip really saved things for me. So whatever it is, constantly make sure that there's air coming out and, and the way to do that when you're just stopping by yourself is very simply. Just put your hand in front of your mouth and, and if you feel the airflow, right, exactly. Uh, so uh, again, if you feel an airflow, you know you're doing it properly. And, and you'll, you'll be able to feel you know, literally your airflow. Uh, so those, like I said, two tips. And also definitely you know, go online and, and just see that there's a lot of singers that share their tips and some will work better for you and some not as well. And just take whatever works. Any other, there was a question back there, um, behind Stuart. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you, you mentioned how you smile and you know, yeah. show that you're, 
I've seen sort of the opposite. I can tell right away if there's someone up there davening, and you get the feeling they don't want to be there. You know, they're there, and they're you know almost like looking at their watch, and you get that feeling, and it's it's such the opposite of what you're describing. It's such a tremendous downer. Like you know, right? Why are you there? You know, right? Right. Yeah. I, I remember once I had such a bad experience. It was Hoshana Rabba, which is a really important day of Tila. And they had some guy who was like the bullet train of Bali Tila. And, and, and I was so upset. Like, why are you deprived? Like, I, you're in a rush and you got breakfast. I, I don't know what's going on, but like, why do we all have to zip through Hoshana's? Like, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, at, at the mosque, at the Grand Mosque, just kind of like zipping around. What is this about? And uh, I completely agree with you. It, it can make a huge difference. And that, and that again goes back to our primary responsibility, was just to bring people along. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Morla David. Um, yes, question. Do you have a comment on? I've, I'd heard that after completing the paragraph, you should say the beginning of the next song. Right, so that I mentioned. Um, in, uh, in general, it's not done. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes with the Karbach Nusuf, that is done. Um, but the, the custom is really not to do that, except for the beginning, the very beginning of the Karbach Right, the right. Al right. Hashem. You know, sorry. I'll tell you one other place I've seen it is um, in a crowd where people don't know the davening at all. Like so, for example, when I daven for six and I synagogue, uh, where Taliban goes out there twice a month, and I'm there fairly often, um, the people there are very mm, unfamiliar, I mean, I mean, not well oriented to the traditional davening. So what I try to do is, as much as possible, give them signposts. So therefore, not only do I start each paragraph out loud, but I also make some noise as I'm dominating. In general, I don't. As a general, if I'm saying this moment, David, I'll just uh, be quiet until I get to the very end. But when I'm in a crowd where I feel like people need to be reassured, like you know the lights are on, like the machine's running, that's what I do. I start at the beginning and just in an undertone read through the entire paragraph. As I saw yeah. I was beginning the next paragraph immediately, Sephardim do that more often. What do you mean? As far as when they're, when they're davening or singing songs, as soon as they finish something, they start the next one almost immediately. Well, you know, i got to tell you, Svartim, if you're talking about Yudhah Mizrah, not just Svartim, but Yudhah Mizrah, they do things quite differently. Uh, they do a lot of things together that we do individually. <clears throat> they sit for a lot of things for which we stand. It's a uh, whole different moment. And they say, <laughs> and they say <laughs> Het. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. I think you were making an interesting point about davening through the rest of the paragraph on your own because, you know, as the Shaliyah Tzibor, aren't we supposed to be making sure we say every word out, you know, that we can hear ourselves daven? It shouldn't just be silent reading kind of thing because um, we're actually saying this for the sake of the whole Tzibor. Right, but not, not so loud so that everybody else would hear no, it. No, but you, that you yourself can hear it. In other words, each of us should know that when we're davening up there, we should say each word. Yeah, yeah, yeah no different than you would you right. know, any time you'd be down. Right. right. Yeah. But yeah, that could be done for the while. Yes. Yeah. Question. Well, well in, in the weekly Dharma or during the Sufi, the Zimra, isn't it sort of the opposite? In other words, you say the beginning of the neck, you finish one uh, hymn and you start, you say the first few words in the neck. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Track. Don't believe that's the case. Let me, let me just check to be sure. Um, well, so well, let's take for example, you know, Ashray, right? So when you would finish, you'd say, and then you go, you know, I'm not, it's interesting. I'm so not used to leading Suki to Simra that I, I can't even do the tune. I have to like reorient myself to get into that headspace. But then I think when you go on to like the next paragraph of Hallelujah. You would say you would only end off yes, some vamana and you blow. The exception to that, I think, would be points in which uh, which people are standing up. So, for example, vayvarth david, where people would be standing up. That I think is more common that, that people will begin um, <clears throat> ashray because it has a certain prominence. I think people begin the paragraph with. But other than that, I think the custom is typically to just do the end. Yeah. I'll tell you if you do the beginning and you stop of course. Um, Certainly, you know, you, you don't get any points off. Uh, I think I'm just describing what I think is common practice. There would be no problem with doing that. I th although I think the most common practice is just to end and not to begin. Well, my, my experience has been that 
system of neurons go very fast and there's a, a variety of speeds that the body can feel or use. Uh, and if they don't if they don't do it at the beginning, sometimes it's very hard to, to actually know where they are. So mm -hmm. well I mean if, but if they if they're ending off the previous paragraph, they're they, you would know where they were because they had just ended one. So I think you'd probably use the end mark as a, as a If the bowel to filler doesn't do it, a number of people in the congregation will do it anyway. <laughs> hey, so you know, again, that, I think that goes back to- It's very annoying. <laughs> yeah, that goes back to just reading your tzibur. And uh, you know, if it's somebody that the tzibur respects, something they want, you know, my feeling is like, let them eat cake, all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy to do that if that's uh, what seems to be your expectation. Yeah. Just a real quick point that ties in that. Uh, my father only gave me one advice about davening, uh, is that that you need to be heard. You know, that's almost the most important thing, right? As a shield tzibur, that you're heard. And then when they're describing a psuke de zirma, a lot of times, especially if a meaning is going faster, uh, the, it's so important for the chazan to be heard, you know, finishing off each paragraph. Sometimes when I sit in, in as, um, when I'm sitting in the tzibur, sometimes I'll just start off something loudly because I get the impression the chazan's a little quiet and maybe people are a little confused. Where are we? But if he finishes it off, you know, loud enough, then you, you'll know where we are. I, I think it's valid. You know, there is an actual important function of the Shleot Tzibur when it comes to parts of davening like Shimon Asrei and Kedusha and so on and so forth. Much less so by Psuki Zimra. I would say that probably the most important function of the Shleot Tzibur of Psuki Zimra is just simply keeping time. Uh, so I think what you're pointing out is absolutely correct. Like, that's your one job. <laughs> you just got to make sure that people know where you are. So. Uh, I would agree, it's, it's an important function, very important function. Okay, Mismo <coughs> Adami, yes? You, you've said again and again, <coughs> is to read the audience. How do you do that? So, I'm always listening to what's going on behind me. Um, <coughs> and, you know, like, if, if things are quiet, um, what I'll try to do is, I'll try to find a tune that is, is like the most well-known tune. Because what that tells me, if the Tebra is very quiet, is that, this is a group that's not as comfortable davening as you know. If you go to a, a like you daven in Lakewood, and I've you know led davening in Lakewood multiple times, people like they know lots and lots and lots of Jewish tunes, and there's there's already a buzz behind you. So there, I feel a lot more comfortable doing things that are more exploratory. So if things are quiet, I'll try to like I said uh, use more typical tunes. Um, if things are quiet, I'll uh, I'll even consider. Uh, singing along a little bit louder so people can hear where I am. Um, when I'm singing a tune, I try to never overpower people to the point where I can't tell what's going on behind me. We've definitely been in dominating situations where the, the chazan is out of sync with the tzibor. And it's, it's a little painful to listen to. It's like, oh, guys, can't you just figure that out? Um, so whenever I'm leading a song, I'm always trying to hear where people are, both in terms of their timing and in terms of their key. But, you know, I, I'm very comfortable up there. I've been up there many times. Um, so it's the kind of thing that I would say, it's an important skill. I remember when I first learned how to drive, this is, you know, I was like, I don't know, 16, 17, 18. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what? Like, because it was 200 feet before the corner, I have to start signaling, and I have to look at the rear view mirror, like, every 10 seconds, and I can't go over the speed limit, and, and you know, I always have to be looking to the right, the left, and the blind spot. Like, how am I going to keep all this stuff down? And then I remember thinking, you know, there are people here in this neighborhood who don't look very intelligent, who, you know, <laughs> frankly look like really legal as drivers, and, and they're driving. So if they figure it out, I'm going to figure it out at some point. <laughs> so, so, you know, so at this point, um, I, it's, it's an automatic response. What I would say is, in a similar way, just like when you want to learn how to drive, as much as it's a pain to check your rear view mirror every 10 seconds, that's what my driving teacher taught me, and that's what I do. Yeah, ever since I was a kid, every 10 seconds, I just, it's a, it's a reflex. I always look at my blind spots, it's a reflex. Except when I'm texting, don't tell my wife. I don't, of course not, I would never text and drive, ever, it's very dangerous. Um, so, uh, in a similar way, what I'd say is try to train yourself in the best possible way, and those habits will stick. So try to train yourself to constantly be thinking about what's going on behind you in addition to what's going on in the sitter in front of you, and it's a, a habit that will serve you well. Okay, moving on. Um, Mizmor David. So people are going to stand up for Mizmor David. 
Um, you, you should expect when people are standing up and sitting down, you should expect to just pause a bit to let that happen. And there are certain parts of davening where there's like shoveling, uh, shuffling that's going to happen. Another classic example is when you get up to Shema Nasrei, right? So if you are up to like Tzor Yisrael or wherever, you should expect that people are going to stand up and when you start hearing the noise of the chairs moving or, you know, the benches coming up or whatever it is, um, that's your cue to give people a little bit of time. Uh, if you've seen like a great speaker, a great comedian, they know how to time things so that they wait until the laughter, the applause dies down and they begin their next sentence. So one of the skills of a good Baltfila is to just be aware of when the shuffling is going on, anticipate it, and then begin it. So here also, Mizmo Adavid is the first uh, instance where you know people are standing up. Typically, it doesn't make much of a difference because yeah, it's the beginning anyways, but just to be aware. Um, the tune changes over here for Kol Hashem Yichol Elayolos. It's not the same as we've been doing at the end of every paragraph, and this is how it goes. Kol Hashem Yichol Elayolos, Vayet Saif Yorois, on a Bekoach. Different places have different menhagim. Um, I think probably the most common is to just sort of let everybody do it quietly as they're sitting down and getting settled for the Chododi. Some places do begin on the Bekoach with <laughs> and then they sort of fall off into silence. Um, so there is a, a traditional tune, and I'll, I'll just do it for, so you can be aware of it. No ye bar dor she ye hood ho, for vast shom rain, for fame at a rain, Rahamin to kill so tall mid gum lame. And then it goes off into silence. Like I said, some places do that, especially more yeshivish places, um, but many places don't do it at all. And then there's also uh, the Kabach, this of does it their own Anabaka. Anabaka. But that's for, for the Kaaba uh, Dami. Okay, Lichadodi. Let's talk about Lichadodi. Very important, before you go up there, and I ask this every time they ask me to dive in up the Ahmed, or if I forget, I make sure to like frantically find somebody who's like within my hand wave, and I ask them before I can begin Lichadodi. Is there a custom to stay, sing straight through, or is there a custom to break it up stanza by stanza? Both practices are very common. Um, in general, in more yeshiva, yeshivish type settings, yeshiva, kolel, lakewood, and so on, they'll do it stanza by stanza. Uh, generally, in a more sort of young Israel type setting, people will just sing it straight through, certainly in a, a setting where people are less familiar with the davening. But always important to find out when they ask you to daven whether it's going to be done stanza by stanza or you say stanza by stanza, you mean you were silent while everybody does the stanza and then you do the refrain? Uh, no, what you would do is lift a dodi the cross kala twice, and then you would be quiet. Right. And then they would do that, and then depending on whether they're more chasidish or not, they would either do one ahead of you, or they'd just do the one that you would do. <coughs> uh, yes? Well, isn't it said through, so that you have a command on the words that are repeated by the chazan in the Hitler? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Uh, no, like each shamar is a the chana the chana is a chana, and then shamar is a chana sort of said through. And then repeated by the chazan in the tune, in order to have come out on the words. Well, so I said, the two ways to do it, I'll, just, I'll, I'll use the most common tune for Lechadodi, and I'll, I'll show you how it's done when it's done stanza by stanza and how it's done uh, singing straight through. So I'll start with singing straight through. Lechadodi likras kala pene shabos ne kapilo Lechadodi likras kala Pene Shabos ne Kapilo Shamor Bizachor Bidibore Kharish Mianu El Amyukhar Adonai Echad Ushmo Echad 
shemos he fares, Elis he loved Hadodi, Big Craskala, Pene Shabos, Negabilo. That's sing it straight through. When you go straight through into Lo Seboshi, where the custom is to switch up the tune. Now, the other way to do it is to do <laughs> Quiet. And then they'll either do Lechadodi twice, and then you'll continue with Shamar, or they'll do Lechadodi twice, they will also say Shamar, and then you'll say Shamar. But usually in a typical shul, you'll have people that are doing both things, so don't bother trying to figure out what they're doing. Just give them some time, let them do their thing, and whenever you're ready, continue on with Shama Rizahar. Um, and what about the numbers of Lechadodi? Oh, yeah, just Zahar Booth, he's right, yeah. Um, can you comment on the appropriateness of the tune? Um, is, can, can it be whatever fits, you can do it? Okay, or, excellent, right, excellent right, question. Because I, I heard a great tune for al Missing, and it works great for Lechadodi, but maybe I should only do that on the Shabbos of Hanukkah. Right. Or, and would, would I get stares if I do it in February? Good, good question. So I would say first, um, in general, you'll always put a smile on people's face if you do seasonal tunes. You know, we have to endure seasonal tunes going shopping for about a month and a half anywhere uh, in the United States. So when you give people something seasonal, so you do, um, let's say you're, you're davening Musaf sometime before Purim, and you break out a, a Shoshana Siakha or something, you will always get a smile. So I would certainly encourage you to use that around the holiday time. The only time it's appropriate to use non, to use holiday tunes when the holiday is not the one you're celebrating right then is for Purim <clears throat> and for Simplest Torah. You know so, that your Kilanari, which is in Tanzi, Tan? Uh, oh, um, uh, Pera, Tani Pera. Tani Pera. He did, he did Lakota Dia Purim. He did, uh, uh, I think, nine different Nigunim. Yeah, that's common. They'll, they'll do like an around the year. Yeah, they'll do it different ways. You know, sometimes we'll do that. Sometimes too. we'll do show tunes. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff people do for them. Um, so uh, what I would say is again, uh, to use a non uh, a non seasonal tune when it's not that season. The only time it's appropriate is Purim, and for most Torah, there's like sort of a license to just have fun and party. But otherwise, try to stick to the season. Although you know, if you do it, let's say a week before, two weeks before, even you know, after sometime after Rosh Chodesh, Kislev for Hanukkah, after Rosh Chodesh, Adar for Perm, you're fine. Um, you just I, I would disagree with you on that point. As far as uh, Simcha Torah, it definitely is a, a Simcha, but it's becoming too much like Purim, and it's not Purim. Okay, so I, I don't take any. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any official policy in drinking and how people, you know, enjoy this Simchat Torah. I can just tell you, the common practice is that the two times of the year in which people will use non-holiday tunes, uh, or, you know, uh, holiday mismatched tunes. holiday tunes, would be Purim and Simchat Torah. Um, you know, certainly in, uh, in shuls where they have a strict, we do Simchat Torah this way style, um, I guess that wouldn't be appropriate. But, you know, in, in many parts of the world that's fine. Um, let me let me mention another uh, c couple other ideas about um, lechadodi tunes. In general, the tune that's done for the first part of lechadodi is a slower tune, slower, more melodic, and lo sevoshi is more upbeat. It's off to do a quick tune for lechadodi. You can, but it will raise eyebrows. People won't be expecting it, and it's dissonant. So I would certainly not recommend doing like a happy, clappy, uppity tune. Um, you know, unless it's one that people do very commonly, like Lechadodi, you might see that that's a more sort of upbeat, bright tune. Um, but it's more common to do slower tunes for Lechadodi. Also, in terms of using secular tunes uh, that are adapted to Jewish words, uh, this has been done for a long, long time. Many Hasidic Rebbe's used Polish marches in their tunes. There's certainly precedent for this practice. I would say that you got to know your crowd. So, you know, if you're davening, if you're, like I mentioned, if you happen to be visiting, a, you know, a child or a child in Long Lakewood, and you're like, oh, wow, you know, there's a great, um, I don't know, popular tune by uh, Simon and Garfunkel or by uh, Billy Joel or whomever, this would be a great place to try it. Wouldn't recommend it. 
Um, although, you know, in a crowd um, of people who will enjoy something like that, I'll totally try things like that. So I've davened many, many times for people who weren't very familiar with davening, and I would try popular tunes with which they were familiar, and they absolutely loved it. So there's nothing uh, sacrilegious about it. You just need to, yeah, it's a, really a personal sensitivity. Well, a comment on that, but, uh, my son, when he was uh, in high school in Yeshiva in Israel, uh, he would sing some songs, uh, and the, uh, the Rebbe from the Yeshiva would ask him where he, he got that, but it was a very good text. And there was one that he told that was from the Tetricus Rebbe. The was the Rebbe. music from the Tetricus video. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What? Rebbe? Tetricus. Some tunes for the Chododi tend to want to repeat themselves on the Chododi line. Oh. But in, the, in between the stanzas, do you say it twice or just one? Good. Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, let, let me repeat the question, Stuart, because this actually comes up quite a bit. Um, there are some tunes that just because of the cadence and the way the tune is structured, uh, and particularly because if you look at the stanzas, the Shamar you know, the, the, um, the stanza is much longer than the chorus. Right? So what people often find themselves doing is having a lot of music for the chorus and not a lot of words. So what do you do there? It's a very common practice for people to repeat, and it's also a common practice for people to do ay ay ay's. Um, I actually spoke to Ray Rosenbaum about this. There's no problem with repeating. It's not like a pusik where you're repeating words. I mean, you've probably been in settings where people don't like to do bayomahu, bayomahu, yeah, Hashem echad. There's no problem here. I mean, it's a, it's really, it's just a piyut. It's a, a poem. It's a liturgical poem, and you're repeating the entire thing twice. So there's really no problem at all. Um, I would say again, it's just sort of a comfort thing. Whenever my personal practice is, whenever I'm in like more yeshivish kind of settings, I don't repeat myself because that's like the way yeshivish people are used to doing things. And if, when I'm in, you know, sort of more uh, forgiving settings, I'll, uh, I'll just repeat myself, and people seem to like that just fine. <laughs> Uh, not that these people are not forgiving. It's when it comes to dodging, they have you know more um, uh, more defined taste. Let's just say things that word. I'll tell you a funny story really quickly. Um, with my, I went to Denver Yeshiva for some years when I was in high school, and apparently at that point in Lakewood, the custom was that they never sang anything. They had like in the Soro, we don't sing. It's just dodging. It's serious stuff. We don't sing. So there was a Purim that fell out on Friday, and L'chadodi, the person who was davening for the Ahmed, had apparently had some non, uh, non simplis Torah l'chaims, and, uh, you know, strictly perm l'chaims, and he sang L'chadodi. So the story they say about the Rosh Hashim of Denver, Rabbi uh, Stromer Kagan, who was quite a, an intense individual, is that he grabbed the guy and schlucked him out of the base measures. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, uh, I don't know what they do in Lakewood now, but... With, 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 with the hook, I mean... You know. <laughs> Okay, so that's, uh, like I said, that's a very common tune uh, for Lucha Dodi. There are many different tunes for Lucha Dodi, and many tunes are adapted uh, to Lucha Dodi. One of my personal favorites is a beautiful, beautiful Madras tune, which you can find online, that goes, many people know it. Lucha Dodi, Likra, So that is my, I'll, I'll give you guys my go-to tunes. That is my go-to tune. Uh, whenever I'm diving to the end, I'm in a place I've never been before, and I just want something safe, something I know, something that people are going to like. That's always my go-to, the Majat Um What is my go-to uh, Lo Seboshi? So this is, uh, this is a little bit different, um, and you, know, you might need to practice it, but there is a Shal Shudas Nigunim. There's Yidid Nefesh and Mizmo Adavid, right? There's a Mizmo Adavid that goes, Mizmo Litavid Hashem Roi. So that tune, is my go-to Los Heboshi. It goes wonderfully well. It has a really bright, energetic kind of a feeling. People love it. And if you're in a, a place where people dance after the, they finish davening, or finish Lachadoti, it, it leads perfectly into dancing. So I'll just sing you the, uh, the, the two stanzas because they repeat. Los Heboshi Los Matemi since I'm in Shomri, I'm going to do it twice. Since I'm in Shomri, I'm going 
Raskalov in Nishabos Nikabilo. Aha, ha, ya, They are you in Chisa Show, so ye fair. Rahaku, come and follow ye. Aha, ha, ya, ya. Yossi, so lie ye, so son alcalo, lecha do di li, cascalo, pinne shabos, ne capillo, lecha do di li, cascalo, pinne shabos, ne capillo. Now, this brings up a question some of you may have, and that is do I bang on the shender and do I clap? And here's my answer. It's the same as uh, many of the other things I've said. When I'm in an audience, I think we'll tolerate it. I absolutely do it. So, you know, in a show like Shomre, when I'm driving for the Elmet, usually they love that kind of thing. I bang, I clap, I really want there to be like energy and rhythm, and I'll totally do it. When I'm driving at Yeshiva, I never do it. Because, you know, Yeshivas have more of a, um, like I said, they have a more, um, State. Defined, right, defined More stages. serious. Uh, <laughs> Which again, you know, I love well, the yeshiva, I'm a yeshiva creature, but uh, that's, uh, so, so, that's my general rule of thumb. Um, I have found that when you bang and when you clap, you give other people the permission to bang and to clap and to tap their feet, and it, it draws people in. Um, let's move on to uh, Boi Bashalom, since we're uh, running uh, into our last five, final five minutes over here. Um, the custom is to turn around to the back of the shoal. Uh, for boy with shell. Now the general custom is to turn clockwise, so you do a <coughs> full clockwise. You do 180 degrees for boy with shell clockwise, and then you do another 180 when you turn back after you finish boy with shell. Also, it's not really a question of looking at the door or you know trying to trying to face the door. It's just in general the back of the shell. So wherever that may be, however that may be oriented, the idea is about 180 degrees. If you're 175, I think you're still okay according to many shitos. Uh, and uh, and then you, you turn back around, <laughs> right? So that's uh, that's boy Michel. Um You'll also you'll notice uh, whether or not uh, they do dancing after davening because very quickly, like you'll see whether a circle is forming. Now, my personal shtick is I always always join the dancing because. I, I want people to feel like I'm there with them in the dominating experience, that if they dance, I dance. So I feel very, very uncomfortable uh, standing up there, you know, just like, do your dancing thing. But I want to communicate as, wow, you love dominating, you love Shabbos, you want to dance, you want to get into this with all of your energy, I'm right there with you. Okay. Um, any questions, any other questions about L'chadodi? Yes. When a Gavai comes up and asks you the last minute, would you like to daven? What questions do you ask? You know, can you ask these things ahead of time? Do you dance here? Do you have being on the Just stand there? Do dancing, you, I, you know, usually don't have much time because it's uh, it's like a really quick thing. Right. Um, so uh, what I will ask is uh, two basic questions: What do you sing, and uh, how do you break up um, either lechatodi or um, kelado in uh, in Shabbos Shoppers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you know, the the bare minimum of what people sing. Excuse me for Kabbalah Shabbos is Lichadodi. Um, and yeah, that's about it. For the, it was bare minimum, just about any minion you're safe. If you sing that, if you don't sing it, you'll raise eyebrows. When it comes to Shabbos Shabbos, and we'll get to that I guess, in another session, the bare minimum would be, let's say, Kel Adon and Kedusha. But certain minyanim have customs to sing other things. For example, many shoals will sing Bishamru to the tune of Mim Kompa. So I want to be aware of that. Some of them will sing out of a koach. So by asking that question, I'm forcing the gabai to just quickly make a mental note of, okay, when is it that we normally sing? And they'll let you know. Uh, and the other thing is, how do you break up davening? In terms of dancing, like I said, you'll, you'll quickly pick up whether people dance or not. Okay. Mizmor Shir Leon uh, the, uh, the ending there is... Um, oh, okay, one other thing, and this is uh, to get back to the question about beginning. Very often, after Lucha uh, Dodi, for whatever reason, people are scattered, either because they've just da danced and now they're getting back to their seats, or because they were singing, clapping, and 
you know, something that I'll do very commonly, again, in a setting like Shomri where I feel like people, you know, will be more forgiving, uh, if the tune is really catching on and people are singing it, even if they're not dancing, I'll go on with the tune. So I sometimes do that at the end of Kedusha, uh, at the end of davening for Tiskabel, I'll sing a tune. And if I feel like people are into it and they're singing, I'll just keep going. So what happens is, is that by the time you're finished with the Chadoti, it's very typical that people will be a little bit scattered and you want to sort of bring them back to that like Zen davening place. So I do very often begin Mizmar Shiri on my Shabbos just to bring people back in and refocus them. So the one place that I will almost always begin again is Mizmar Shiri on my Shabbos. And that's just Mizmar Shiri on my Shabbos. And it's just totally a place marker. Um, Sedikatam Ray Fro Kerez Babanon Is Geshisuim Bebez Adonai Bechatz Rose Elohim Yafriku Ohon Hinuvun Beseba Dishanim Rananim Yu Lehagi Kyashar Adonai Tsuri Velo Ablosabo Important note, uh, okay, I'll get to your, your question in a moment. Some communities don't say Tzadi Katamri out loud. They'll go straight from Mizmar Shir to Hashem Mala. Uh, just something to be aware of. So what I will typically do is I'll listen in to see if people are stopping at a Sabo, and you'll have plenty of opportunities to notice because people just by habit will sort of hum along the end of their uh, stands or whatever it may be. So don't be surprised if they go on to Hashem Allah. If they are, go along with them and just say Mikolos. Yes, question. Your ode, if I tried that, I'd get a hernia. Right, right. So my question is, how much wiggle room do you have in the tomb? Uh, if you're kind of sort of there, but it's, you know, it's not really exactly on point, um, is that legit? <laughs> totally legit. It yeah. goes back to the, you know, you don't have to have a voice. Just give them an experience, yeah. right? So the same thing over here. If you if you do that at a much lower level, let's say you do. Um, and you do that much lower. That's fine. That's fine. And so long as you're there with them, totally. Nobody will ever hold that against you. Uh, okay, Mikolos. And, you know, it's, um, I guess I, I've developed a habit of doing things with a little bit of flair, so forgive me. Feel free to ratchet it back. It's, it's just totally fine. Mikolos, ma'im ramadim rimish pereyom, adir b'amorom adonai, edosecho nem numio, leves von avor kodesh, adonai, leorech yomim. And with that, you've finished Kabbalah Shabbos. The, the tzibur, if there is a, a, a um, yasum in the tzibur, the person will stand up, they'll say Kaddish, and otherwise you'll go straight on to Bama Malikim. Guess with that, we bring the first session of Kabbalah Shabbos to a close. Any final questions? Yes? Uh, I, you mentioned some people don't say Tzadik uh, Tamar. My great-grandfather was a chazan. And he, that we had tapes of him, and he didn't say that out loud. And my brother, a lot sometimes doesn't do that. But in, if you're in a show like this, that they do, it's remarkably confusing. If everyone's expecting it, right. and you're not totally. doing it, so I because then they're all catching it. up, right? And then they're going, wait, what happens? Wait, 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 wait. Right. So, hey. I, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So they, they just go again. It goes back to just sort of being aware of what's going on. You know, checking your rear view mirror every ten seconds. Uh,